Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Ask Historian Podcast. Today, we are welcoming Owl of Division, also known as Danielle Tom, to the Ask Historian Podcast. The conversation today will be an 18th century visual culture and the life of various artists and the invention and popularization of the caricature. We also discuss what it's like to work inside a museum and how to get a job inside a museum. I think it's a great conversation that you will really enjoy. But first things first, as we did not have a book drawing last podcast, we'll be doing it this one. The books to choose from this week are The Flash Press, Boarding Mail Weeklies in 1840s New York, which I have been reading and enjoying lately. It's about the topsy-turvy mail culture in the 1840s New York City and their brushes with pornography, gossip, and blackmail, and includes lots of selections from the said Flash Press. The second is The Rules of the Game, Jotland and British Naval Command by Andrew Gordon, recommended by user J. Schooltiger which was praised for providing an engrossing education, not only in naval strategy and tactics, but in Victorian social attitudes and the influence of character on history. The third option is Hogarth, Art and Ideas by Mark Hallett, used by our interviewee in her thesis and covers one of the central figures we discussed. The winner is, drum roll please, Lars in bar A. And thank you very much for supporting us on Patreon, Lars. And for all of you guys, please do come by and join us on Patreon. Each um, donation is eligible for a entry into our monthly book drawing. And at $5, you get two entries. And at $10, you get more. As for that, thank you. And here's the conversation. Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Today, we are incredibly lucky to be joined by user Owl of Derision on Ask Historians, better known to her friends and family as Danielle Tom. Danielle is a curator at the Museum of London and studies British decorative arts, craft, and sculpture from the 18th century to the current day. She has written extensively on English satirical prints and is currently working on a manuscript. Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. We're really excited to have you today. So let's start where we usually start. What got you interested in the field of history in general and especially visual arts? History in general was something I always liked at school. Um, Obviously the way history is taught in British schools, it's very, you know, Nazis, communism, Nazis, communism, oh, the slave trade. And (laughs) it can be a slightly, I mean, it's all, it's all important stuff, of course, but it can be slightly disjointed. You don't always get a sense of, how particular historical moments or movements have come from earlier things. So I guess I I enjoyed it in school, but I always wanted to go further. I always wanted to know more. So it was something I just, you know, being a a teenage nerd, read about a lot, went to the local library. And I decided ultimately when I went to university to do a history degree, because that's what I realized was, was my real interest. I was warned at the time, you know, history degree won't get you a job in anything. Here I am. You finally you made it, huh? Yeah, definitely. What does um, being a visual historian mean to you? How does that differ from like regular traditional history, like diplomatic yeah. military history? Uh, yeah. Um, well, it's complementary rather than distinct, I would say. I mean, technically, I'm an art historian. My postgraduate degrees are in art history. But I always think of myself as a historian who happens to work primarily with visual sources, with pictures, with objects, rather than with written archives. Um, So to me, there isn't actually that much difference in how you read a written text and how you read a picture. You know, they're they're all constructed from a a kind of a a language of symbols and signs. I mean, I'm very much a a semiotician when it comes to methodology. Uh, So for me, visual history is just historical methods apply to a different kind of source. It's not this great distinct thing sitting off on its own by in isolation. Um, in addition to being a visual historian, um, you also work at the Curator at the Museum of London. So what's that like? What, what do you do there and how do you get into that field? It's such a great job. So I have a very strange but very exciting job title. I'm the Curator of Making. What that basically means is that I look after their decorative and applied arts collection, anything that has a kind of history of making in its in its process. So jewelry, ceramics, silverware, uh, glassware, and 
that's a really interesting job because it's so diverse. I cover such a lot of stuff and quite a broad time period. So the way I got into this job, um, the job I have now, I've only been in for six months. Before that, I was an assistant curator at the, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, which is obviously a really well-known museum of art and design. And before that, I did a PhD. And while I was doing my PhD, I did voluntary work in smaller museums to build up experience. So for anyone who is looking to get into a kind of museum job from a historical or an art historical background, and I don't know if maybe you want to talk about this in more detail later in the podcast, I would say that the, the things you really have to be able to demonstrate are simultaneously a real um, knowledge of and passion for your subject area, but also you need to get practical experience because it's not like doing research in a university context. You have to be very hands-on. You have to be a good project manager. You have to be good at, let's say, the logistics of putting together an exhibition. You've got to be quite a creative thinker. The research, it's important, but it's only part of what we do. That, that's, that's interesting. We, we can actually talk about that right yeah. now. Um, what, um, so obviously you said as a visual historian, you're looking at text and you're reading them yeah. sort of like you do with the language, how does that yeah. shift or change when it comes to jewelry or art or physical items or anything like that? Yeah, when I say that an object or a picture, say, can be read like a text, what I mean is that, of course, we're looking for clues in the appearance. And that's not just things like the design, but also clues as to the way something's been handled, the way it's been stored. That's part of an object's story. So, for example, you can tell by, you know, if a, if a piece of ceramic ware, a plate or something is cracked in a particular way, that suggests something about perhaps the way it was fired in a hill, maybe the way it's been handled historically. Like, you know, older, cheaper pieces of ceramic ware are more likely to be kind of beaten up and chipped, whereas precious, expensive porcelain is probably has been kept in good condition. That tells us something about the relative value that's been placed on these types of object by the people who owned them back in the day. There are all sorts of little clues if you know what to look for. One of my absolute favorite moments as a curator came when I worked at the Victoria and Albert Museum, when I had to remove an artifact from its display case for conservation purposes. It needed to be checked. And it's a little wax model, about five or six inches high. It's a model that the artist Michelangelo made as a kind of practice sketch for one of his full-size marble sculptures. It's called The Dying Slave, and right. the marble is in Florence. We had this little wax model. I'm holding it in my hand. I had a glove on, but it kind of in my hand. And pressed into the wax is a thumbprint. And I oh. looked at that and went, that's Michelangelo's thumbprint. And I'm holding it in my hand. And it, it just doesn't get better than that. That sense of connection through the object with a historical moment. It can be very powerful sometimes, and it's a real privilege, actually, to be able to handle these objects, use them, look at them in such detail. I think so, too. Um, my One of my own experiences was um, Rembrandt, uh, mm. very well-known, did a series of pornographic works yeah. uh, that are actually now preserved at um, the Indiana Bloomington Kinsey Institute Archive. Mm -hmm. And I went there and I was doing some research and I was talking to the archivist and they, she's like, oh, wait, I had this thing. So she dredged up all these old Rembrandt works that are, I don't know how many millions of dollars and so rare, but it was just so cool to see how he had like put the way out of the work. Yeah, I, I love that kind of sense of unexpected discovery. And that's, I guess that's the same for any researcher, but working in the museum context just opens up this wider scope of things you can look at and connections you can make between objects. So um, in my manuscript research, which is kind of separate from my main job, I'm researching a sculptor called Joseph Nollikens, who was a British 18th century sculptor, very prolific, very interesting. And last year I was at the Huntington Library in, Cal in California doing some research on him. And I found a sketch, not by him, but by his father, who was a painter, also called Nollikens, obviously. Mm -hmm. But then I realized that the little boy in the sketch was my artist. It was, the, it was the painter painting his son who would grow up to be the famous sculptor. And right, again, right. just that sense of 
very personal and intimate connection with an artist, with a historical moment, finding this thing unexpectedly in storage. It's, it's really quite profoundly moving sometimes. I think I wanted to draw on something you mentioned in your thesis and uh, mm -hmm. titled Visualizing Politeness and Patriotism in the Public Sphere in English Satirical Prints. Yes. Um, you bring up the point that we as historians have to be careful looking at a, a sculpture or a caricature or anything visual and assuming yeah. it meant the same thing to us as it did to them. Yes, absolutely. So an 18th century or a 19th century person even would have had a very different approach when coming at a specific object. Yes, potentially. And even then within that, within that, say, that 18th century moment, multiple people are having multiple approaches to a particular object. So a really good example is nude neoclassical sculpture which has this kind of very interesting dual meaning in the 18th century that today you know you walk through a museum you see let's be honest lots of marble bottoms and boobs and things on display but you know it's marble it's art so it's not really titillating or it's it doesn't really have the same impact on us but in the 18th century certainly in britain it's only in the second half of the century that you start to have what are effectively public art galleries, places where people who aren't royalty, who aren't private aristocratic collectors can go and look at the latest painting, the latest sculpture and so on. So you have these you know, marble sculptures being made, being displayed in the classical style, you know, emulating the works of Greece and Rome. So we're talking about the, the marble full size nude. And on the one hand, this style of sculpture is being uh, celebrated by critics and connoisseurs as you know, the most perfect iteration of the human form, as the absolute highest in artistic achievement, in um, you know, as something that emulates the greatness of the ancient world and so on. But at the same time, people are suddenly being confronted with naked forms uh, in a way that is actually new and quite shocking. And uh, there's this wonderful uh, the thing I came across, an, an edition of the Times newspaper in 1788, where there was a report on the annual art exhibition that was held in London in the Royal Academy each year. So for that year, there were a number of male nude statues on display. And the anonymous reporter had written in the Times that uh, there was not so much as a fig leaf <laughs> to cover, you know, of the sculpture and that apparently when the royal family came to visit the exhibition they were offended and something had to be hastily arranged and so this reporter is going on at length kind of turns into an opinion column about how they think it's disgraceful that the male nude form should be visible in public in this way um, so there's this real kind of duality mm -hmm. even in that time about how different objects are perceived, treated, interacted with. And then, of course, if you take something like a nude statue today, it doesn't really have the same impact on us. Mm -hmm. it, it's something that we look at and think, oh, yeah, that's that, I guess. But unless you know, it's something you're particularly into and interested in, like I am, it kind of becomes a backdrop. You know, we have statues all over the place. And in terms of the nudity, well, there's far worse available on the Internet. So it doesn't have the same impact. The context has changed over time. That's something I I mentioned in my research a lot too. I talk about, mm -hmm. well, you go to a famous museum and you see all these paintings of beautiful women reclining yeah. in chairs or running away from men, but yes. why makes that art and what, what difference that from pornography? And, and I think the thing I usually settle on is it's the access of the public to the individual item. Yes, I think that's part of it. it. It's a highly contextual thing. And sometimes it really is in the eye of the beholder. So in, um, in 18th century Spain, for example, it's much harder to get away with producing nude art in, in painting or in sculpture. So um, some of you, um, you and, and some of the listeners may know uh, Goya's two works, the, um, the dressed Maja, Maja being the kind of um, characteristic peasant dress of Spain, and the nude Maja. Right. Um, the same woman in a reclining pose, but in one picture, she's fully dressed in 
effectively national costume, very elaborate, lots of lace and silk. And in the other painting, um, she's completely naked, reclining in a very inviting way on the sofa. And this was the kind of thing that, in, in the Spanish context at least, had to be kept like, discreet because the power of the church was such that you couldn't just go about openly painting nudes and putting it on public display. So even when we think of Western European art, I guess that isn't a monolith either. What was acceptable in Britain or France was not necessarily acceptable in Spain, for example. Right. I think that's, that's a good, really good point. Um, to get to somewhat focus on your thesis, could you talk yes. a little bit about how the academy established itself, how like you had the higher form of art um, that the satirical print in some extent reacted to and against? Yes, absolutely. So the Royal Academy is not the very first kind of body of professional artists in Britain, but it is the first to be recognised as royal as such in that it is given a charter by the king which incorporates it as an established professional body. And that's in 1768. Before that, you have various drawing schools and societies of artists. They're kind of loose informal associations. So the Royal Academy really puts the kind of professional art world on the cultural map. It's a kind of cultural patriotism, if you like. These artists are saying, well, you know, France has had an academy for decades now, and Italy is kind of the center of the art world, but British art is just as good, and we're going to make a distinct British school, and we're really going to put it on the map as a, as a kind of an international, international art scene. So the president is Sir Joshua Reynolds, uh, who is primarily a portrait painter, and Reynolds is interesting because he has these very, very specific and pronounced ideas about what art should be and how art should kind of elevate a person's morals when they look at it. Art should try to emulate the best of nature in order to inspire the mind to greatness. It's not just about making something that is a faithful visual representation. It's not just about showing off your skill. In fact, the truly great artist kind of hides their skill, if you see what I mean. Their art is so natural that you don't really see the hand of the artist in the work. So it's a very didactic organization with very specific principles. But within that, it's a relatively, for the time, diverse body. There are even, believe it or not, women in the original lineup of Academy members, Angelica Kaufman and Mary Moser, both of whom are painters. So within this academy, you have the kind of the official line on what art is and what it should be. But then you've also got quite a lot of diverse opinions on what makes a good painting, what is it for, how commercial should artists be, how much should they pretend that money doesn't matter. Of course, it matters. You're trying to sell your work. But it obviously elicits quite strong reactions, both um, among artists themselves and among the kind of broader, if you like, cultural sphere of 18th century Britain. So there are a number of prints which are produced um, in direct response to the Academy's foundation. I think at, at this point it might be helpful for me to explain like, why would anybody go to the trouble of making a print. So the, the whole purpose of uh, print culture in, in 18th century Britain is that it's meant to be simultaneously informative, entertaining, and critical. So it's a combination of news, comedy, and opinion, if you, if you want to give the kind of modern spin. So there are prints produced in reaction to most of the major news events of the 18th century, peace treaties, new governments, um, royal scandals, that kind of thing. Uh, the whole world of politics and the economy and celebrity and theatre, anything you can think of that was happening, there's usually a print produced in response to it. There are also quite generic prints, which aren't responses to particular social events, but are more intended to mock kind of social foibles, like people who spend too much money on their clothes and go out looking ridiculous, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So to, to clarify, is a print would a print appear like in a newspaper? Is it like a separate item? Is it produced like just to be handed out? At this point, most prints are produced as individual sheets of paper that you could buy in a specialist shop. 
So there are numerous print shops dotted around London. They originally cluster around St Paul's Churchyard, which is still there today. In fact, the Museum of London is just around the corner. Mm -hmm. uh, around Paternoster Square, which was the centre of the London publishing trade. And then as prints become more fashionable and even more expensive, print shops start opening in places like Piccadilly and Mayfair, which is where the aristocracy lives. Because prints are not cheap. Um, you could pay up to a shilling, which if you were, let's say, uh, a labourer, a skilled labourer working for a workshop of some description, a shilling is a substantial sum of money because you would expect to earn about 20 shillings a week. Mm -hmm. And I, that's your entire earnings. So 20 shillings a week, and that's your rent, your food, your clothing, everything. So a shilling is a substantial sum of money to the poor. If you're rich, obviously, it's less of an issue. But even if you couldn't buy a print, you could still see one because print shops plastered their windows mm -hmm. with the things that they were publishing. So anybody could stop in the street and have a look. And it was very common also to find them stuck up in taverns and coffee houses. So you didn't necessarily have to buy one to see one. They had a much broader impact than their relatively small number of buyers would suggest. So that's for context, to, to, to give you the sense that the Royal Academy is a pretty big deal and is the kind of thing that would have opinion print, satirical prints produced in response to it. But one of the reasons why it is mocked in some prints when it's first founded is that one of the things they intended to do was when they put on this annual exhibition of what was then contemporary art, they wanted to charge entry. They wanted to charge a shilling. Again, we understand that's a fair amount of money to anyone who wanted to come in. Uh, they had to buy a shilling catalog and that's what got you into the exhibition. Earlier societies of artists had exhibited their work for free. And there was a feeling that charging money was, in, to use a word from the period, illiberal. That is to, to say that it was deliberately shutting people out. And it was. Those who were advocates within the Academy of charging this fee, so, um, they suggested it because, precisely because they wanted the, the room that the paintings were in, or the rooms, I should say, to be relatively exclusive. They didn't want the riffraff in there. They wanted it to be an audience of well-to-do, learned uh, men and women, connoisseurs, sophisticated people who could appreciate what they were looking at. They didn't want, you know, the labourers and the maidservants and the apprentices and the beggars and the prostitutes of 18th century London right. working their way into the crowd. Inevitably, though, they did get in. Either they wangled their way in or they found a shilling from somewhere. And going to the summer exhibition, as it is, and it still exists today, it's still on every summer in London, going to the exhibition became as much a social thing as a cultural experience. It was, you would go to see and be seen as much as you would go to look at the art. And that's something that is a constant topic of satirical prints in the later 18th century. The thing to remember as well is that a lot of the artists who are producing satirical work, which is in quite a kind of, often a sort of a body, low genre tradition, are also trained by the academy. So they understand the structures of high art. They understand the kind of the formulas and the languages of how you put together a, a sort of a great painting or sculpture. But they are consciously choosing to produce art in this kind of lowbrow style because A, it sells, mm -hmm. it's immensely popular, and B, they feel that that's a more effective kind of symbolic vehicle for getting their opinions across. If high art is restricted to that which is, you know, moral and inspiring and good, well, that's, that's a whole lot of other subject matter that's not getting addressed. You know, that's a lot that's being excluded. Where, you know, where's the comedy? Where's the horror? Where's the, you know, the, the sexy prints and the scatological prints? There's this whole market untapped by the academic world. And so, you know, a number of artists, people like Thomas Rowlandson and James Gilray, they see a market, they see a gap, and they take it. Mm -hmm. So let's, so we have this higher um, academy, obviously, and these satirical yeah. 
um, artists, they see that market and they see a place to exploit. And that same thing mm -hmm. happens. I would in in the print world as well. The same thing happening in the book market. Yes. So they're now talking to what we've come to refer as the public sphere. <laughs> yeah. How, how is that different from the public and private sphere? How does that sort of play into um, the development? So the public sphere is obviously, like so many historical concepts, it's a kind of 20th century concept that we've retroactively used to explain developments in 18th century society. So the originator of the public sphere, as many listeners will, of course, know, is Jürgen Habermas, who's still alive, by the way. Um, I had no idea. Yeah, I know. Um, I only realised just the other day. Uh, at least I hope he is by the time this goes to work. <laughs> it's very old. Anyway, I digress. So Habermas posits that the public sphere, which is different from what he calls the representative sphere, which I'll get back to in a second, is something that comes about, first of all, in Britain in the late 17th century. Now he says that what comes before the public sphere, this representative sphere, is a kind of cultural structure in which the elite class, let's say the aristocracy, um, use culture to represent their power. They put on, you know, pageants and things like that. They pub, in a, in a public sense, they show to the people how powerful they are via their control of cultural representation, hence the representative public. The true public sphere, Habermas argues, only comes about in late 17th century Britain after the Civil War, after the Restoration, when you effectively have a parliamentary democracy and you have the development of things like coffee shops, places where the kind of the independent public person, usually a man, they can come together for the purposes of conversation, for exchanging political and cultural opinion. They become a kind of a public and that public, if you like, is separate from, but related to power structures like government. So you can be a kind of a private individual, let's say a merchant or a doctor or something of that sort and have no formal direct involvement in politics, but you are still a political being. You are still a member of the public. So that's, that's the kind of the origin there. With regard to print culture, prints are a kind of a vital medium of exchange for the public because they are, for example, a vital mechanism by which politics and politicians can be criticised, often quite brutally and bluntly, and the royal family as well aren't safe from that form of criticism. It's quite difficult to prosecute a print seller or a print maker for libel. It's not impossible, but it's mm -hmm. difficult. So as long as they observe a few basic precautions, such as never writing the target's name in full, they'll write like Lord H or Lord B or the K and Q instead of the King and Queen. Um, they can very disingenuously argue that they didn't intend it as a portrait of that person at all. Oh no. <laughs> and to actually prosecute for libel is difficult. This, this gives printmakers and publishers a lot of leeway. And if you look at the works of people like James Gilray, for example, I mean, they, they're showing that they're producing prints showing the Royal family, you know, literally pooping themselves into a, into a pot. It's, it's grotesque. It's funny, it's extremely witty and clever, but it is highly critical of those in power. And therefore, it's this, it is this vital kind of safety valve for the public. It's a means by which people can let off steam their, their frustrations with the party in power, with the monarchy, with the various power structures that govern their lives. How did these satirical prints develop over the beginning of the 18th century? Who were the figures that really came to attention and got a lot of um, renown? Okay, so to give you a sort of potted history of satirical prints, the, there is a longer history of, if you like, political printmaking that goes right back to the 17th century. So you have all of these Civil War woodcuts, for example. They're relatively crude. They're relatively cheap. But... At the very end of the 17th century, there's one crucial legislative change that paves the way for the printing explosion of the 18th century. And it's in 1695, the Print Licensing Act 
lapses in Parliament, it's up for renewal, and they don't quite get round to renewing it. But what this effectively means is that in order to operate a printing press, you don't have to go through the same legislative hoops and pay the same taxes that you did previously. So it becomes much easier to set yourself up as a printer and publisher. And that's, that goes for text as well as for visual, you know, for image-based prints. That goes for newspapers and books and pamphlets and all kinds of things. So there is, broadly speaking, an explosion of print in all its forms in the 18th century. So in the earliest decades of the century, you still have these crude woodcuts. You're increasingly getting um, engravings where the, the copper plate is literally graved into with a, a sharp tool to create a kind of negative image. And then the ink is applied and the paper is applied. Mm -hmm. Then by the middle of the 18th century, a new technique starts to be used. Again, has existed before, but it really kind of explodes in popularity among printmakers, and that's etching. Etching works slightly differently to engraving. Um, I won't go into the full explanation now because it's quite difficult to imagine it if you can't see it in front of you. But basically, you have your copper plate, you cover the plate in a layer of something acid resistant like wax, and you scratch your design into the wax. Then you dip the whole thing in acid. The acid bites wherever you scratched the wax away. Mm -hmm. and then wash the whole thing off and it was the case that this form of printmaking is very quick and also um, because you can go into quite fine detail with the needle in the wax you could create quite sophisticated um, almost in some cases painterly designs so etching is a kind of a technological development that paves the way for printing to become very responsive to the news. So there's a there's this whole spectrum of quality in the second half of the 18th century. There are these exquisite prints done in mezzo tint, which is where you have a kind of a, a a needle on a roller picking out individual dots like like paint strokes, and they look like paintings and they're expensive and high quality, the kind of thing you'd find in a collector's cabinet. And then there are these cheap quite nasty rubbish around the edges, etchings, which are just knocked up in an attic somewhere and printed in a couple of hundred copies, you know, mocking some celebrity or something like that. Mm -hmm. Whole gamut of quality. Um, but there are a handful of significant artists who take advantage of these technological developments and of this kind of legal vacuum and realize that there is a market for images that are critical and entertaining and informative. The other contextual thing you have to remember is that the entirety of the 18th century is this very politically turbulent time. Uh, so that there is not just an ability to make these prints, there's a market for them. People want a mechanism by which they can express their titillation at these very profound political and social changes that are happening around them. So, you have people in the first instance, like William Hogarth, who many people will have heard of. Hogarth was a painter in the first instance, but many of his series of paintings, he turned into engravings. And then you could purchase the series of engravings as a set or as individuals. And his, his style was not so much, Hogarth's style was not so much about responding to news items as and when they happened. Rather, he produced what he called modern moral subjects. So paintings or series of paintings that took a kind of a hypothetical situation that reflected the social realities of the day. So some people may be familiar with a series like the Harlot's Progress, the Rake's Progress, that showed the kind of moral risks and feelings that faced uh, young people launched upon the world for the first time. So Hogarth is very much a high-end printmaker. His prints are expensive. Uh, they're well regarded by collectors and by his fellow artists. And later in the period, you get people like Thomas Rowlandson and James Gilray, who are really the giants of the late 18th century. They're, they're quite distinct in their style, but they're both important for different reasons. So Rowlandson tends to focus on social satire. His prints are about making fun of, you know, aristocrats and celebrities and mocking the latest fashions and, 
you know, prostitutes and courtesans and musicians. His his prints are quite joyful in a way. He he seems to be laughing along with people when he mocks them. He also has a, a neat sideline in very, very graphic pornographic prints, um, which are really interesting, partly from my point of view, because they often use nude sculptures as part of their kind of storytelling. They have the they're focused around things like the uh, the Pygmalion myth, where the sculpture comes to life. Although in Rowlandson's representation, it's a sexy sculpture doing sexy things. Yeah, um, Gilray is quite different. So James Gilray is um, almost the same age as Rowlandson, but he he's a sort of a, a tormented soul, if you like. So his prints are predominantly political, as in they are responding specifically to individual politicians, to legislation, to political developments in Britain. And his prints are, I mean, they're insanely detailed and they're full, absolutely chock full of literary, biblical, historical references. They often parody existing works of art. Um, and the, if you like, the reader, the viewer of a Gilray print um, would presumably have been quite a, an educated, learned person in their own right if they wanted to get all of these references. Gilray um, is enormously successful in the 1780s and 90s. And, and as I mentioned earlier, he was later in the pay of the government. But Gilray actually suffers, um, I guess, what we would describe today as a, a nervous breakdown. Um, and you can really see that in a lot of his images. There is this kind of tormented, um, anguished quality, but they are, in, you know, they're incredibly well executed. They're incredibly well conceived. So between the two of them, Gilray and Rowlandson kind of dominate the market. There are numerous other printmakers and artists, but many of them were anonymous. And those that weren't didn't reach, I mean, they, they were good, but they didn't reach the same heights that these two did. So they were really the dominant figures up to about 1810 after which you have Cruikshank, but of course he is neutered, if you like. His political kind of bite is neutered by more, more money from the, the king. So in whole, it's really Hogarth, Gilray and Rowlandson who are the, the significant figures of this satirical scene in the 18th and early 19th century. To draw on what you're saying about Hogarth and Gilray, um, their, their audiences specifically, you, you mentioned that like, a highly educated person would get more out of a Hogarth print. But Hogarth, I think, is so famous because like Shakespeare, he was able to apply, able to appeal to both the upper classes and the lower classes. Yeah. Can you talk to some extent about how the audience would understand or react to specific things or how an upper class person might read it differently than a lower class person? Yeah, absolutely. So it, it's not even so much about class difference because what you have to remember is that in, let's say, 18th century London, there is this sort of, if you like, artisan class of people who are skilled workers. They're not aristocratic. They're not landowners. They're not rich, although they may be comfortably off, but they're pretty well educated. They haven't necessarily familiarized themselves with, you know, the great works of classical, you know, Latin and Greek literature and history, but they're still, you know, they're informed people. They're very politically aware. They will have a good grasp of modern literature and current affairs and that kind of thing. So actually, you know, London being what it was in that period, most of its inhabitants are pretty, you know, they're, they're smart people. They know what's going on. It's a metropolis of, you know, cultural exchange and information exchange. It's a global hub. So in fact, the kind of illiterate, uneducated, yokel stereotype doesn't really hold true in the London context. I mean, obviously there are people who are exceptionally poor and who don't have any educational opportunities, but the kind of the audience who can appreciate these prints is much wider than you might imagine. By the end of the 18th century, there are a million people in London. It's not much by the standards of today, but then it made it the biggest city in Europe, possibly the world. So London was preeminent. And so the audience for these caricatures they're not so much differentiated by class, they're differentiated, I guess, by their level of reference. So yes, it's correct to say that not everybody is going to get allusions to, you know, the Iliad in a Gilray print, but most people are going to know which politician is being caricatured, you know, 
they're going to recognize their face. And this is the other thing. It's a smaller city. People actually saw on a daily basis the, the people in power. You know, if you were a politician, you still had to get in your carriage to go from your home to Westminster to sit in Parliament. You know, the mob, if you like, knew what everybody looked like. You would see the king and the queen going around on a fairly regular basis. You would see them in person. So there wasn't that same sense of distance and remoteness. So you would know if somebody was being caricatured. You knew, um, you know, what the latest scandals were. Word got around fairly straightforwardly. So it's more to do with um, the depth of your education, the, the breadth of your references that determine the extent to which you can kind of delve into the structures and symbols of a print. The, mm. the great thing, of course, is they are visual. So even if you can't read, and these things will have captions and speech bubbles and titles, even if you can't read that material, you could still get a sense or you, could, you can effectively get the gist of it just by looking at it. Mm -hmm. The, the other thing as well is that looking at prints more often than not was a communal experience in this period. It was very often the case that looking at prints together, you know, with, with friends um, or with peers would be a kind of an accepted social activity. So, for example, if you were having, you know, people around to your, your genteel home and you were putting on uh, card games and, and, and wine for them as sort of a social evening at home. What people often did is that they would hire a portfolio of prints from their nearest print seller. They wouldn't necessarily own them, but they'd hire them by the evening. And then people could leaf through them, you know, chatting away among each other, working out together, what do you think that means and what do you think this means? So there's that kind of knowledge exchange that's happening while people experience these prints. So even if you don't get a reference, your brother or your next door neighbor or your wife might well be able to tell you what it means. Did it come to be seen as a source of danger by the people in power or did they <coughs> it as a sort of safety valve? Um, absolutely, eventually as a source of danger. The power of the caricaturist is such that by the 1790s, which of course you know, is a very volatile time, there's a revolution in France, there are radical um, thinkers and pamphleteers trying to spread unrest in Britain. Various caricaturists, and Gilray is one of them, they are actually offered basically pensions, annuities, uh, to produce propaganda, if you like, mm -hmm. for the government. They, they could, so Gilray continues to produce these very vicious, very explicit, um, and very clever caricatures, but now he's in the pay of the government. So he's producing caricatures against the French, for example. Uh, there's a really famous one, which some people may be familiar with, and it's called something like Un Petit Souper à saint Colot. It shows a family of working class French revolutionaries cannibalizing their victims from the guillotine. So literally, you know, tearing bodies apart, eating eyeballs, a baby being roasted over the stove. You know, Gilray doesn't pull any punches, but now He's receiving money from the government to produce this kind of thing, to kind of stir up um, hatred of the French among the British public. A little bit later, well, quite a bit later, actually, um, in the 1820s, George Cruikshank, who is one of the Cruikshank family of caricaturists, he originally produces a series of really scathing caricatures against the, the new king, George IV, who was previously the Prince Regent. He shows him as the Prince of Wales. Now, he was obviously literally the Prince of Wales, as in England and Wales, but he was also enormously fat. So Cruikshank caricatures him as a whale certainly hurts his feelings. So <laughs> desperate not to be ridiculed in public any more than he has to be, the new king actually tries to buy up all of the, the engraved copper plates, which is what the prints are taken from. So, uh, you know, you would do your design on paper it would be etched or engraved into a sheet of copper and then inked and then the paper pressed on it. And you get hundreds of copies from one copper plate before it started to wear down and it was getting a bit useless. So by buying the plates, it's like the, the equivalent of getting hold of the source code of something today and not letting anybody else know what it is. The, the plate is the negative. So he's so frightened that he offers Cruikshank, you know, a substantial amount of money eventually. And again, he goes into the pay of not the government as such, but into the pay of the royal family. And he becomes this very kind of tame Victorian 
moral caricaturist towards the end of his life. So yes, there is definitely a perception and a realistic perception that satirical printmaking is, is politically dangerous. It is very powerful at directing public opinion. And if public opinion is not in your favor, you do everything you can to get it to turn the other way. So how did they actually manage to become so powerful that the Prince of Wales has to intervene? Well, it's not that they are newly powerful. They always were powerful, I think. What you have to understand about these prints is that they occupy a very specific and relatively short cultural moment. There's this kind of golden age of satirical printmaking between about 1760 and, and 1820. Now, there are prints produced before and after that, but it's in this kind of this window of about 60 years that they are both incredibly sophisticated in both their, their imagery and their ability to respond to events and in their reach. And one of the reasons that they then cease to be powerful and sophisticated is um, it's really it, it, uh, partly a cultural change and partly a technological change. So from a cultural point of view, by the early 19th century, society is by and large getting quite conservative. It's kind of a backlash to the French Revolution. Social mores are getting narrower and narrower. And compared to, say, the early 18th century, which is actually a relatively liberal and libertine time, things like gender roles and class hierarchies are becoming far more strictly enforced between about 1790 and 1825-30. So what we call Victorian morality Queen Victoria comes to the throne in 1837, but that so-called Victorian morality is actually earlier in its inception. It's something that starts to affect society in the very first decades of the 19th century. So there isn't the same appetite for body, risque, scatological humour full stop, and there certainly isn't the same appetite for um, consuming material that is critical of government and of the monarchy. I mean, there's some, but not to the same degree. So that's the cultural shift. The technological shift is to do with paper and printing techniques. So by the sort of 1840s, late 1830s, early 1840s, mm -hmm. paper starts to become cheaper and it becomes much more feasible to produce an entire illustrated periodical. So prints now are no longer or very rarely being sold as individual sheets of paper. Instead, you can spend you know, a penny or sixpence, a relatively affordable sum, and buy something like Punch magazine, which comes in in the 1840s, or the Illustrated London News. And these are, for the first time, proper illustrated newspapers. So the engravings, which are by this time done on wood rather than copper, because it's cheaper, are incorporated in the tech of the journals, of the periodicals. So there, isn't, there just isn't the market for these individual caricatures at this point. There isn't the appetite and there isn't the technological need. So by, you know, sort of 1810, 20, it's kind of the last hurrah of the great caricaturists. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so we did talk about how they were dangerous. Um, and we talked about how the, the satirical print kind of came to an end um, to bring us to sort of a conclusion, what ties everything together? Why is the 18th century special? What, what interested you specifically with that? I'm glad you asked me this because in my opinion, the 18th century is the best century. I agree. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so for me, and this is, I, I guess this is highly personal and people may disagree. For me, what makes the 18th century such a fascinating period and such an important period is that it's a time in which you see a lot of structures and belief systems from the medieval and early modern period kind of coming to an end or evolving into something unrecognizable. And you see a lot of the structures and technologies and principles that we still use and experience today starting. So it's a real period of overlap. There are still, if you like, hangovers from the Middle Ages. From, from the early modern period. You know, many people still believe in magic, for example, not necessarily witchcraft, but you know, spells, um, love spells and potions and that kind of thing. Religion, religious division is still sufficiently provocative 
that there are riots over religious differences, and the Gordon riots in mm. 1780 are prompted by the prospect of Catholics being given more legal rights. And so a number of uh, Protestant sort of workmen and, and apprentices go on the rampage for several days. And that's a very simplified version, but that's what it boils down to. Um, on the other hand, you have things introduced or developed that we still take for granted today. Newspapers, for example. The stagecoach system with toll roads was kind of a forerunner of our modern transport network. Art galleries, which I mentioned earlier, the idea that you could go out as, as a member of the public, not to somebody's palatial home, and pay your fee and go in and see something. The whole kind of sphere of commercialised leisure, of buying tickets for something, this is all an 18th century innovation. So as I say, it's this very kind of fluctuating time, this very crucial time that, that shapes the world as we understand it today. There's a lot in the period that's deeply unfamiliar to us, but there's also a lot we can recognize. In my view, the 18th century is the first modern century, and that's why it's important. I think that brings us to kind of the perfect conclusion. Would you like to talk about what you're currently researching on now? Yes, yes. So it's a couple of different things. So of course, within um, my museum job, um, I'm looking after this wonderful collection of decorative and applied art, and actually uh, not 18th century at all. One thing I'm trying to do at the minute is to research more um, contemporary craftspeople. Mm -hmm. and, to, and it's interesting, actually, because such a lot of what they do relates back to kind of ground that was first forged in the 18th century. So for me, there's a nice continuity there. So that's something I'm doing within the kind of um, nine to five of my job. Something else I'm working on that I've been working on for several years now, and I'm getting to the end, I think, is my book manuscript, which is about the sculptor I mentioned, uh, Joseph Nollikins. He's a British sculptor. He is very long lived, born in 1737, dies in 1823, and he's incredibly commercially successful. He corners the market in producing portrait busts of wealthy people. When he dies, he's worth £200,000 in old well, money. Like, yeah, in, in old money, not in modern money, which, I mean, the conversion is always slightly, the way you convert old money to new is slightly up for debate, but that would definitely be in the tens of millions today. So he died a very wealthy man in a period where a lot of artists were, you know, starving in attics. Um, so to me, that, that's interesting how he combines his artistic skills with his kind of business head and makes the two work together very well. So that's my project that I'm working on at the minute. Hopefully that manuscript will be finished next year. And if it gets accepted for publication, maybe 2019 is when we're looking at, uh, looking at that coming out. So fingers crossed. Um, so great. I think you've given us a absolutely fantastic history of the development of satirical print and caricatures but I'm sure that some of the listeners will still have some other questions. So we will have a follow-up thread posted in Ask Historians, and Great. I'm sure you will come sw hopefully swing by and answer any follow-up questions. Absolutely. Very glad to take questions. Thank you very much for joining us today on the Ask Historians podcast. Thank you. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. For more history like this, visit us at reddit.com slash r slash askhistorians and ask over a hundred historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know in history. Find us on Twitter as at AskHistorians, and subscribe to the show on iTunes. Or visit askhistorians.libsyn.com. Thank you very much for listening, and join us next time on the Ask Historians podcast.